Welcome to Engedrian. If this is your first time listening, or even if you are returning, be sure to follow us on Facebook, X, formerly Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, and YouTube for additional content, battle maps, and background details. We hope you are enjoying our adventure. Let's see what happens next. The party make constitution saving throws, DC 13, roll 7, 13, 14, 8, 21, 7, and 11. The hike back up the dunes to the point of landing proves to be extremely difficult after a long day of mapping the city, and though the temperature is cool and cooling faster as Isvara drops in the sky, Umgern, Peace, Case, and Malaysia find themselves quite tired and having trouble making it up the sandy dunes. Fodinus, Theophania, and Inesel seem to have no problem and push the others. Umgern, Peace, Case, and Malaysia suffer one level of exhaustion. After struggling with the dunes for nearly an hour, the party crests a large dune and sees the ship hovering ten feet off the ground with the ladder extended. They happily climb to the top, one at a time, and then pull the ladder up after everyone is boarded. Captain Fishdwain dispenses with pleasantries and immediately takes to the sky, journeying back to the hidden mountain anchor point. Gathered below deck, once the ship is secured and with lookout Philby above, they begin their debrief. We were able to map about half of the ruins today in detail. NSL pulls out her map and shows it to Captain Fishtwain. The notes are detailed and give the approximate size of each building, a general description, and a note on any contents worth possibly re-examining in detail once the site is secured. Some of the notes include small drawings of patterns and etchings on walls. The party and crew make history checks. Roll 19, 3, 20, 14, 18, 19, 11, and 9, 6, 2, and 4. Umgern looks at the markings and notes that they look very similar to architecture in a book on religions of Angedrian that he studied, specifically of the kingdom of Lelimenstein. Theophania recognizes a pattern in the buildings and the large remaining arches and notes that such vaulted roads were the main city designs of Lelimenstein, according to a book on ancient architecture that she read in Devamir. Inesel explains how the type of grass that is growing in this area and the diversity of the palm trees is all new growth within the last several years, but some of the wall paintings in the buildings showed oak, fir, birch, maple, and cedar trees in scenes of city life. Case notes that based on his understanding of the Underdark, there is nothing below this ruin relative to the Underdark except a long tunnel leading north towards Elestidun, which is at least five days' journey on foot. So, is the blight what it used to be called the Lemonstein? Malage studies the images and notes on the map carefully, and Isel points out several similar drawings and common architectural designs. It would seem so. Theophania and I have both read about the Lemonstein clearly, but I must confess, I did not know where it was geographically in Engadrian. Umgern folds his arms across his chest, and Theophania nods. Any signs of anyone else having been here? Captain Fishdwain sits down in a chair, chewing on his pipe. No, our familiars were very careful to look for tracks, debris, recent campfires, etc. As far as we could tell in the northern part of the ruin, no one has been here in a very long time. Inesel pauses and closes her eyes in concentration. When she opens them, she blinks. But then, where did the bats and the dragon come from, if not here? There is still the southern half of the ruin to map, Inesel. Fodinus twirls a dagger in his fingers. And the line. Peace sips hot tea that they made for everyone from palm fruits they collected at the ruins. What mine? Fishdwain sits up from his chair and leans forward. At the eastern edge of the ruin, at the base of the mountains, there appeared to be a mine entrance that was overgrown with some structure around them. Malage sips his tea as well and smiles, nodding at Peace. Well, an old mine will be a good place for dragons and kobolds and bats to hide. Best to be careful. Fishdwain chews more aggressively on his pipe. If possible, Fishdwain, could we be dropped off on the western edge of the ruin on the south side tomorrow and picked up back up there? The climb out of the dunes almost killed us. 
Umgern pats his thighs vigorously, which still burn and ache. Aye, climbing a sand dune in the desert will kill you. Lucky for you lot that the weather is so cool here this time of year. But yes, we can likely do that. I suggest you all get some hard sleep, and for you magic types, best be prepared to any fighting magic you have for tomorrow. We were lucky today to not be bothered, but if that dragon has friends, they will know something is wrong by the morn. The party takes a long rest. Isvara rises somewhat early with only the vast stretch of ocean to the horizon between the lonely lady and the bright light. The sky is cloudless and still. The party gathers on the deck with the captain and his crew to look back at Phila in the early morning light and prepare for their second day of mapping out the ruins. The eyes of the familiars had found two statues and towers that may or may not have had some sort of unique markings on them or possibly were inlaid with precious gems and metals. It was difficult to tell. There were three buildings in the northern half of the city which had structures inside that Inesil marked as worth a second look. Possibly stone coffers or sealed vessels of rock. After a hearty breakfast of dragon meat, the party restocked with extra rations, prepared spells more aligned with the potential conflict, and agreed upon the scouting plan for the day. Less than an hour later, Captain Fishdwain lowered the ship to about 10 feet off the ground in the southwest corner of the ruins. The party climbs down quickly and surveys the immediate area. The party makes stealth, investigation, and perception checks. Rolls 15, 24, 10, 21, 11, 10, and 13. Rolls 14, 8, 2, 10, 3, 1, and 10. And rolls 2, 18, 10, 18, 6, 7, and 12. The end of the sandy dunes from the coast catch the breeze off the water, which leaves a dirty haze all around the party, making it very difficult to see anything. As such, Fodinus, Inesel, and Malage keep their footing as they move towards the first of the ruins, but the rest of the party slips and slides in the sand, making a bit of a racket despite the wind. As the sand begins to clear closer to the buildings, Inesel and Malage both see a sparkle or glint of something near one of the tall archways that vanishes almost immediately. The central and southern rivers are not close to the archway, so a reflection off water is not likely. They both hold up their hands in a fist for the rest of the party to stop, drop down low, and watch. As they watch the ruins in the distance where the flash originated from, the sand around them seems very calm and still as the breeze has died down for a moment. In the cell and Malage, still keenly observing their surroundings, notice slight bulges in the sand ahead of them that seem to be moving. Inesel nods to Theophania, who notches an arrow and fires it at one of the moving bulges. Theophania makes a longbow attack with disadvantage versus armor class 15, rolls 9 for a miss. Theophania's arrow whips through the air and hits the moving bulge, but seems to stop and then roll down the sand, having not hit anything solid. As they watch, the bulges, which there are now at least seven of, seem to have stopped dead still. Umgern motions for everyone to stay completely still as creatures that burrow, in his experience, can sense movement on the ground. He is immediately concerned that these could be Kruthic with their last experience in Pathelia and does not wish to face any of those this morning. Inesel casts magic stone and Malage uses magical tinkering. Inesel twirls her fingers over three shiny stones in her hands and whispers, causing them to glow brightly for a second. Similarly, Malage has four pieces of obsidian in his hand with a small caliper and causes them to glow brightly for a second. From Malage's hand, a rhythmic thump begins. He immediately hurls all four stones far to the right of the party, while Inesel hurls all three stones to the far left of the party. As soon as Malage's scattered bits of obsidian land, they begin a loud thumping. Inesel's stones strike the sand with a loud snap, but then lay quiet. As the party watches, three of the bulges move towards Malaysia's ruckus, while the other three moves towards Inesel's. The middle bulge does not move. Case shakes his head, pointing at the last bulge. No one moves. After less than a minute, the party can see small pincers and feelers poking up through the sand near the stones. One of the pieces of obsidian vanishes under the sand. After a second, it emerges high in the air and lands near Case's feet, the surface of the stone hissing and bubbling with acid. Everyone draws their weapons and looks at Umgern. He points at Inesel, Peace, and Fodinus and indicates they should attack the left group. He points at Malage and towards the single bulge. He nods at Case and Theophania that they should all attack the right group. Malage casts Message. 
Malaysia waves his hand at Umgern, points a finger at him, and whispers a message. I will get them to the surface. Umgern furrows his brow and then nods. Malaysia waves everyone to move away from him and places his hands on the ground. Malaysia casts a thunder wave into the ground. An enormous peal of thunder erupts into the sand under Malaysia's feet, shifting the sand next to him away from him. But the loud underground cacophony had the desired effect. The seven bulges suddenly erupt from the sand to reveal large insectoid creatures which looked like oversized fleas. The party receives one round of surprise attack each due to disorientation of the giant sand fleas. Theophania makes two longbow attacks, Hordebreaker, at sand flea F and G, rolls 22 for 6 piercing damage and 24 for 11 piercing damage. Theophania launches two arrows from her longbow at the fleas closest to her, striking both of them in the carapace and causing them to shriek. Malage summons Eldritch Cannon, Force Ballista, and casts Firebolt at Giant Sandfleet D, rolls 22 for 6 fire damage. Malage manipulates his tools, and a small cannon appears in front of him with four gangly, spider-like legs. The cannon is pointed at the flea directly ahead of him. He whispers and contorts his hand, and a bolt of fire erupts from his hands and strikes the flea in the face, causing its antenna to singe. Footiness attacks Giant Sand Flea C with Short Sword, Surprise, Sneak, Assassinate. Attacks Giant Sand Flea B with Short Sword, Surprise, Assassinate. Rolls 25 critical for 14 damage plus 14 sneak attack damage plus 14 surprise attack damage, 38 total damage. Rolls 28 critical for 7 piercing damage plus 15 surprise damage, 22 damage total. Fodinus, with the element of surprise, charges the nearest flea and slashes with his short sword, catching it just under its head and slicing open the head and abdomen, killing it instantly. He spins towards the next flea and slashes with his offhand short sword, slicing deeply into its abdomen but not ending the beast. Peace attacks Giant Sand Flea B with Agile Spear, moves to melee with Giant Sand Flea A, spins one key point to make Fury of Blows, rolls 16 versus Armor Class 15 for a hit, doing 8 piercing damage, killing it, rolls 17 for 8 bludgeoning damage and 12 for a miss. Peace, seeing Fodinus down one flea and mortally injure a second one, hurls their spear at the injured flea, skewering it in the face and killing it instantly. They charge the remaining flea on the left and using key infused claws, swipe at the flea twice, landing a solid slash across its abdomen. Case manifests an echo between Giant Sand Flea E and G, attacks Giant Sand Flea E with Spear, unleashes Echo for an attack on Giant Sand Flea E, rolls 26 for 10 piercing damage and 11 for a miss. Case bumps his fists together and a grayish echo of himself appears between the two fleas to the right. He hurls his spear at the nearest flea, stabbing it in the neck. His echo swings at the same flea but misses as the flea winces from the spear attack. Inicel casts Ice Knife at Giant Flea F, rolls 25 for a hit, dealing 3 piercing damage to it. Fleas roll dex saves of 14, 15, and 17, 3 saves, no damage from Exploding Knife. Inicel balls her hand and clutches her staff, sending a shard of ice streaking toward the fleas near Case's Echo. The middle flea is struck by the ice, which bounces off its carapace and explodes high in the air, which they easily avoid. Case's echo, unable to move, is shredded by the ice shards and vanishes. Umgern casts Guiding Bolt at Giant Sand Flea G, rolls 19 versus AC 15 for 13 radiant damage. Umgern releases a bolt of radiant light from his fist, clutching his amulet, which streaks towards the flea on his right, striking it in the face, causing it to wince and shriek, and illuminating it in a ghostly glow. Everyone rolls for initiative. Theophania casts Hail of Thorns, attacks Giant Flea F with Longbow, Hordebreaker, Giant Flea G, rolls 20 versus AC 15 for a hit for 4 piercing damage, Giant Flea F and G make dexterity saving throws, roll 14 and 6, Hail of Thorns, 2 damage, Hordebreaker rolls 11 for a miss. Theophania murmurs a few mystical words and her arrow illuminates with small thorns. She launches the arrow at the middle flea to the right, striking it in the carapace again. A shower of thorns erupt from the shaft and tear through both beasts. She launches a second arrow at the adjacent flea, but it misses wide and sticks in the sand. Giant Sand Flea A uses Caustic Saliva Spray, 
rolls 5 acid damage. Peace and NSL make DC 13 dex saving throws. Roll 18 and 18 for 3 damage each. The last flea to the left hisses loudly and a 5 foot wide, 20 foot long spray of acid emerges from his maw towards Peace and NSL, who dodge the brunt of it but are burned just a bit. Malage fires Eldritch Cannon at Giant Sand Flea D, casts Firebolt. Rolls 8 for a miss, and 12 for a miss. Malage activates his Force Cannon, firing a blast of energy towards the flea, but hitting just in front of it, causing a burst of sand to erupt into the air. He follows it quickly with a Firebolt, but the flea, dodging the sand, sidesteps making the Firebolt miss. Giant Sand Flea D moves 30 feet, attacks Eldritch Cannon with Smother, rolls 24 critical for 22 bludgeoning damage, destroying it. The large flea in front of Malage seems annoyed by the cannon blast and charges forward, leaps, and lands on top of it, smashing it into a dozen pieces. Giant Sand Flea F moves 20 feet to Umgern's left, uses caustic saliva spray, rolls 10 damage. Umgern, Theophania, and Case make deck saving throws, roll 4, 14, and 21, two saves and one fail. The middle flea on the right rushes across the sand and turns back towards Umgern, releasing a spray of acid at Umgern, Case, and Theophania. The bulk of the blast hits Umgern in the chest, but it deflects much of the rest away from Case and Theophania, who are only mildly burned. Footiness moves into melee with Giant Sandflea A, makes two short sword attacks, sneak attack, rolls eight and eight for misses. Footiness slides next to Peace and makes two quick slashes at the remaining flea. However, the sand is slippery and both of his swings are too high, bouncing off the creature's carapace harmlessly. Giant Sand Flea G moves 15 feet to Theophania's right, uses caustic saliva spray, rolls 4 damage. Umgern, Theophania, and Case make deck saving throws, roll 5, 21, and 20. The Far Flea on the right moves across the sand and turns back towards Theophania, releasing a spray of acid at Umgern, Case, and Theophania. Having just witnessed this, Theophania and Case dive out of the way, but the bulk of the blast again hits Umgern in the back. Giant Sand Flea E moves toward Case and uses Smother, rolls 8 for a miss. The remaining flea on the right charges towards Case, leaps, and tries to smother him, but Case easily pushes the beast off of him and back to the ground. Peace attacks Giant Sand Flea A with Claws and then Fury of Blows, one key point. Rolls 26 critical for 13 slashing damage, rolls 13 for a miss, rolls 16 for a hit for 5 slashing damage. Peace, still stinging from the acid spray, unleashes three rapid claw strikes on the flea, landing two which gash open its abdomen, killing it instantly. Case makes a two-handed spear attack at Giant Sand Flea E, launches Dancing Longsword at Giant Sand Flea E, rolls 18 for 8 piercing damage and 22 for 9 slashing damage. Case tosses his Dancing Longsword into the air, then grabs his spear in both hands and lunges towards the flea in front of him. As his spear pierces through its head, the longsword slashes through its carapace, killing it instantly. Inicel moves into melee with Giant Sand Flea D, makes a scimitar attack, rolls 16 for 7 slashing damage. Inicel rushes the flea next to Malage that just crushed his cannon, and slashes with her scimitar, cutting through two of its legs. Umgern moves into melee with Giant Sand Flea F, makes two scimitar attacks, rolls 23 for 7 slashing damage and 9 for a miss. Umgern, burning from the acid and very angry, rushes the nearest flea with his scimitar and swings down through the creature's abdomen, slicing it. His scimitar buries in the sand so that his backswing is off balance and misses completely. Theophania moves into melee with Giant Sand Flea G, makes two short sword attacks, rolls 20 for 6 piercing damage and 14 for a miss. Theophania charges the flea nearest her and slashes twice with her short swords, cleaving through part of the carapace with one pass. Malage casts Create Bonfire, rolls 2 damage, Giant Sand Flea D makes a deck saving throw, rolls 13 versus DC 14, fails for 2 fire damage. Faced with the flea that just crushed his cannon, Malage erupts a giant bonfire under the flea, singeing its legs and antenna. Giant Sand Flea D tries to smother Malage, rolls 8 for a miss, attempts to move out of melee from NSL and Malage. NSL's attack of opportunity rolls 19 for 8 slashing damage. Malage's attack of opportunity rolls 20 for 7 piercing damage. 
The flea in front of Malaise leaps out of the bonfire trying to smother him, but fails and falls back into the flames. The beast panics and rushes away from Inesel and Malaise, who both take attacks of opportunity, landing them in the flea's back and killing it instantly. Giant Sand Flea F attempts to recharge Acid Spray. Rolls 1, fails. Attempts to use Smother on Umgern. Rolls 14 for a miss. The flea engaged with Umgern tries to leap on top of him, but Umgern pushes it back down with his scimitar easily. Fodinus moves 30 feet to Giant Sand Flea F, makes one short sword attack. Rolls 28 critical for 10 piercing damage plus 14 sneak attack damage. Fodinus bolts towards the flea with Umgern with his short sword raised over his head, swinging it downward when he is in reach, cleaving the flea in half. Giant Sand Flea G attempts to recharge Acid Spray. Rolls 2, fails. Uses Smother on Theophania. Rolls 23 versus Armor Class 17 for 12 bludgeoning damage. Theophania makes a Strength saving throw versus DC 14. Rolls a 9, is restrained. The flea facing Theophania leaps into the air and comes down on her quite hard, pinning her to the sandy ground below. Peace moves into melee with giant sand flea G, makes one claw attack, uses key to make two fury of blows attacks, rolls nine, seven, and thirteen for misses. Peace, seeing Theophania struggling under the large beast, rushes towards it to swipe again three times with its claws, but slides on the sand when they are in melee, missing with all three passes and colliding with Theophania and the flea. Case moves dancing longsword to attack giant sand flea G. Attacks with spear two-handed. Rolls a 27 critical for 11 slashing damage from the longsword and a 26 for 9 piercing damage. Case charges the last flea covering Theophania and slashes it with his magical longsword in midair while thrusting his spear deep into its carapace, killing it instantly. The party receives 200 experience points each. NSL passes around potions of healing to Case, Umgern, Theophania, and Peace, healing all of them to full health. Inesel makes a nature check, assisted by Theophania, advantage, rolls 15. Inesel and Theophania examine the corpses of the flea-like beasts and determine that these are, in fact, giant sand fleas. The meat is dry and tasteless, and the carapace for all of them, though possibly useful in making armor, has been completely destroyed in the battle. They do manage to salvage the acid pouches from five of the creatures. Inesel receives five acid pouches, ranged attack with damage of 2d6 acid. Fleas typically drink the blood of larger mammals, yes? Fodinus kicks one of the carcasses. Yes, that's true, but what kind of creature could these possibly feed off of? And there is nothing on these creatures that would have made a shiny flash, as far as I can see. Inesel and Theophania begin dragging the corpses to Malaysia's bonfire, where one beast is already mostly burned up. Case and Fadinus follow suit. After a few minutes, all seven corpses are burning in the morning air, producing an acrid brown smoke that smells like sulfur and tar. Let's not wait around to find out. Umgern herds the party towards the ruins. Everyone calls their familiars, and the process of mapping the ruins begins. As with the day before, the first pass moving west to east takes more than four hours, but goes off without incident or encounter. As with the day before, NSL marks the map with as many details as possible, transmitted from the familiars. At the eastern edge of the ruins, they decide to break for a meal and a short rest. Inesel reviews the map and makes several notes about additional interesting buildings. Peace makes cups of tea for everyone from some herbs that they brought and assures everyone it will calm them. Once they have completed their short rest, they agree that the last of the mapping back towards the extraction site will only take about three hours. They are now close to the central river, moving along the buildings with their familiars. The shore of the river is variably high and low, creating patches of mud. The party makes stealth checks. Roll 23, 9, 20, 7, 11, 9, and 24. Fodinus, Case, and Peace move quietly through the ruins with their familiars. Inesel, Malage, Umgern, and Theophania struggle with the buildings closer to the river as the land is softer with mud, causing them to slip and slide, falling a few times and making a lot of noise. Several rocks and debris slide into the river and disturb the slow-flowing water with loud splashes. The party looks at the water and notices that, though the river is 20 to 25 feet wide in most places, it looks very deep. 
Malaj pulls a piece of obsidian from his bag, tinkers it to glow with five feet of bright light, and tosses it into the water. The party watches as it sinks for a very long time and then blinks out of sight. Must be at least 25 feet or more deep. Malaj looks at the group curiously. Perhaps. And deep water can hide in many things. Amgarn stares concerned at the river's surface. A silvery flash catches his eye under the water. As we may soon find out. The surface of the water erupts with a large blue silver head full of teeth on a long neck that snaps its jaws and swims towards the party. Everyone rolls for initiative. Fodinus attacks Plesiosaurus with short sword. Surprise, sneak, assassinate. Second attack with offhand short sword. Rolls 20 versus AC 13 for a hit for 17 piercing damage, 20 surprise attack damage, and 11 sneak attack damage, 38 total damage. Rolls 26 for 8 piercing damage. Fodinus, wasting no time and taking the initiative, slashes at the large water beast with his short sword, making a huge gash in its neck, which bleeds profusely. The second slash of his offhand sword makes a more superficial cut along the beast's side. Case throws his longsword into the air, makes a grapple attempt on Plesiosaurus A. Rolls 21 athletics check versus 22 Plesiosaurus, fails, falls to the riverbank, difficult terrain. Rolls 16 longsword attack versus AC 13 for 13 slashing damage. Case joins Fadinus in attacking the water beast by tossing his longsword into the air, which makes a slashing attack across the creature's back. Case attempts to leap onto the creature's back to grapple it, but fails, sliding off the side and onto the muddy riverbank where his feet are submerged. Plesiosaurus A makes a bite attack at Case, rolls 10 for a miss. The injured and bleeding water beast blindly snaps its jaws at Case next to it in the river, but misses, distracted by pain. Its profuse bleeding has filled the river with blood. Plesiosaurus C attacks the Ophania with a bite. Rolls 23 versus AC 17 for a hit for 12 piercing damage. From out of the water to the right of the first beast erupts a second beast which darts its long neck forward and snaps its jaws onto Theophania's back. Umgern casts Searing Smite, attacks Plesiosaurus C with Scimitar. Rolls 17 for 11 slashing damage and 5 fire damage. Plesiosaurus is on fire. Seeing the new creature bite the Ophania, Umgren murmurs holy words, igniting his scimitar, and brings it down on the creature's head, causing it to burst into flames and scream. Plesiosaurus B attacks Malaj with a bite, rolls 22 versus AC 17 for 13 piercing damage. A third water beast erupts to the left of the first and immediately chomps onto Malaj with its massive jaws. Malaj uses burning hands, rolls 10 fire damage. Plesiosaurus B rolls 21 dex saving throw saves. Plesiosaurus A rolls 8 dex saving throw fails. Fresh out of the jaws of the massive water creature, Malaj unleashes a line of fire from his hands at both beasts. The original creature takes the brunt of the fiery blast, screeches one last time, and collapses. The other beast darts its head to the side and only receives minor burns to its neck. Theophania casts Hunter's Mark on Plesiosaurus C, attacks with short sword, rolls a 27 critical for a hit for 14 piercing damage plus 5 Hunter's Mark damage. Theophania, equally unhappy about the chomp from the beast, murmurs arcane words and encircles its head in a ring of red. She slashes at the beast with her short sword, catching it across the neck, causing a deep gash. Peace moves to Plesiosaurus B, attacks three times with claws, key enhanced fury of blows. Rolls a 26 critical for 10 slashing damage, rolls 18 for 9 slashing damage, and rolls 12 for a miss. Peace charges the water beast attacking Malaj and uses their key to deliver three quick claw slashes, two of which rake the beast's neck and slash the skin. Inacel moves to Plesiosaurus B, attacks with scimitar, rolls 11 for a miss. Inacel joins Peace and Malaj at the left water beast and makes a cut with her scimitar at the beast's neck, but it darts out of the way. Fodinus attacks Plesiosaurus C with short swords twice, sneak attack, rolls 15 for 10 piercing damage, plus 3 sneak attack damage, rolls 25 for 3 piercing damage. Seeing the middle beast fall, Fodinus turns to the creature on the right and makes two solid slashes with his short sword, cutting into the beast's flipper. 
case, moves to Plesiosaurus B, attacks two-handed with his spear, uses Dancing Longsword. Rolls 19 for a hit, for 13 piercing damage. Rolls 18 for a hit, for 7 slashing damage. Case moves to assist Malage, Peace, and Innocel, and lunges into the beast with his spear, stabbing it in the neck. His Dancing Longsword joins him and makes a slash across the beast's back. Plesiosaurus C attacks Theophania with a bite. Rolls Con Saving Throw, Searing Smite. Rolls 20 versus AC 17 for 11 piercing damage. Rolls 8 Con Saving Throw for a fail, takes 6 fire damage. The beast engaged with Theophania, Fodinus, and Umgern seems to have a taste for Centaur and chomps Theophania again, deeply cutting into her sides and legs. The flames from Umgern's strike burn brighter and the creature howls with pain. Umgern makes two scimitar attacks on Plesiosaurus C, rolls 9 for a miss, rolls 17 for a hit for 4 slashing damage. Umgern moves close to the beast to try and protect Theophania, making a quick scimitar slash which misses because he is too close for leverage, however his backswing catches the beast in the shoulder. Plesiosaurus B attacks Innocel with a bite, rolls 7 for a miss. The water beast to the left didn't much like the flavor of a genasi or its flames and goes for a taste of Innocel, but she blocks its teeth with her shield. Malage casts Firebolt at Plesiosaurus B, rolls 15 for a hit for 9 fire damage. Malage produces a small bolt of flame in his hand and it streaks towards the water beast, colliding with its eye. Theophania attacks Plesiosaurus C twice with short swords, rolls 11 and 9 for misses. Theophania, struggling with the wounds from the two bites, attempts to slash the beast again, still marked with her magic, but her strength is fleeting and both swings seem to just bounce off the creature's hide. Peace attacks Plesiosaurus B three times with claws, key enhanced fury of blows, rolls 15 for 8 slashing damage, 22 for 9 slashing damage, and 19 for 9 slashing damage. Peace moves closer to the water beast in front of them and again uses their key to deliver three quick claw slashes, all three of which slash deeply into the beast's neck and chest, severing a major vessel and sending it crashing onto the shore. Innocel moves to Theophania, uses Healer's Kit, Feet, Healer, restores 11 hit points. Innocel rushes to Theophania and uses her Healer's Kit to stop the bleeding. Vodinus attacks Plesiosaurus C with short swords twice, rolls 26 for 11 piercing damage. Fodinus charges the last creature on the right and makes one solid slash with his short sword, cutting the beast's neck deeply and causing it to collapse to the shore. The party receives 200 experience points each. Innocel uses a healer's kit on Malage. She gives Theophania a potion of greater healing and Malage a potion of healing. Innocel makes a nature check assisted by Theophania advantage, rolls 17. Innocel and Theophania inspect the creatures and determine that they are Plesiosaurus, very aggressive underwater reptiles. Together, they skin the three beasts and obtain 30 pounds of skin, which Theophania stretches out on the ground and begins covering with sand. Innocel is also able to extract 69 teeth from the three beasts, which she says are used in making superior arrows, to which Theophania nods. Vodinus strips to his loincloth and harvests 60 pieces of meat, 240 pounds. Malage makes a smith's tools check, rolls 19. Malage sets up a large bed of fire and creates a giant stone stove from pieces of the ruin which is able to accommodate all of the meat. He spends an hour flaming the coals and cooking the meat completely. The rest of the party takes a short rest during this time. When the rest is finished, Malage collects the meat in his bag of holding and the party pushes the carcasses back into the water where they sink. Hundreds of fish, turtles, and some larger creatures immediately begin feasting on the flesh of the corpses as they sink. The party completes their scouting of the southern half of the ruins with no further interruptions. Of note on this scouting, one of the buildings, a rather ornate one though still worn heavily by time, had what appeared to be a stone door in the floor which they had not seen in other locations. Close to evening, as Isvara begins to set behind their mountain island they've been using for a secure campsite, the lonely lady comes into view, descending towards the extraction point. They see Philby on the front of the ship, waving as Seraphine drops the ladder. 
Everyone climbs up as quickly as they can, and Umgern motions for Fishdwain to get them away from there as soon as possible. Within an hour, they are back in their secure site on the side of the mountain. Malage unpacks the meat from his bag and puts it in the storage on the ship with lots of salt. He pulls 11 pounds of it out for dinner and brings it back to the party. Captain Fishdwain wants to hear the entire story of the water creatures and is also curious about the large fleas. Everyone recounts their role in the fights and Inesel gives an overview of her map updates, including the trap door. I've got good news and bad news. Captain Fishdwain picks Plesiosaurus meat from his teeth with a bone pick. The good news is that this area appears to be very safe for repatriation, and we can likely send in a larger force to secure it as soon as possible. That will allow you to further explore into the blight. He pauses, pulls a particularly large piece of meat from between his front teeth, and eats it. The bad news is that the lonely lady only has four more days of flight before her fuels for both the dirigible and the engines need to be refilled. It will take us three days from now to get back to the launch base in Pathelia for refueling. So you've got one more day here tomorrow. As I see it, there is this trap door, there is the mine on the eastern side, and then there are all these curious things in a cell marked for rechecking. He looks at everyone smiling in a proud but concerned manner. That's not the only option, Captain. Malage sits up from his seat. If we unload all of our provisions in a secure building in the ruins, we have more than enough food and water to stay here until you return with more fuel. It would be seven days, assuming you need a day to restock the ship. I, for one, would like to stay. We've handled quite a few beasts and creatures. I can't imagine there would be much worse things. Malage seems overly confident in his idea, but still smiles assuredly at everyone. The party looks around at each other, unsure what everyone is thinking. Malage makes a persuasion check versus the party's insight checks. Rolls two, a critical one. Everyone seems unsure, sighs deeply, or looks off in the distance. We have no idea what could be in those caves, Malage, or down the trap door. Maybe there is nothing in either. Maybe the places we've marked are nothing of value or importance. It would take us, at the most, three days to explore all three. If we are here for seven days, what are we going to do for the last four? Case has no one to fight. You have no one to impress with your juggling. Let's just pick one, do that tomorrow, and we can tackle the other two when we get back. Fodinus sits back in his chair and smiles broadly, attempting to reassure the Genasi. That actually makes a lot of sense, Fodinus. I was just so excited. Malage settles back in his chair with a slightly broken but still shining smile. <clears throat> then, what shall it be? Umgern sits forward and pulls his augury runes from his bag to use as voting tools. The party rolls for their vote for which tasks to complete. 1d12, 1 through 4, ruins, 5 through 8, trap door, 9 through 12, caverns. Roll, 5, 8, 11, 8, 4, 11, and 5. I would like to suggest we clear the ruins of Inicel's interesting places, minus the trap door. Umgern puts one of his runes in a pile by itself. I vote for the trap door. Fodinus takes another rune and places it in a separate pile. Quickly, Inesel, Malage, and Peace also place a rune in Fodinus's pile and nod. I think the caverns would be more prudent. Could be a good hideout. Good place for a fight. Case places a rune in a third pile. Theophania smiles at Case and adds one to his pile. All right, we have four votes for the trap door. Umgern gathers up all the runes into his hand. Umgern uses augury. The result is weal and woe. Hmm. It seems that deciding on the trap door could be both a good and a bad idea. <laughs> but what would he call the last two days? Umgern laughs and collects the runes and returns them to his bag. Then we have decided that we will explore the trap door tomorrow, Captain Fishtwain. Then we will return to Pithilia.
The following morning, Isvara again rises on a cloudless day and the party can see the sea for many miles is calm and flat. In the very far distant horizon, the subtle outline of hills suggests where Santernalfus resides. For breakfast, the last of the red dragon meat is consumed. Malage, being eager to still stay despite the party's decision, did an assessment of all of their food on board. Just so everyone is clear, we have ten quindays worth of food for the whole party, including the captain and his crew. Everyone smiles and laughs at the eager Genasi's desire to stay, but no one takes him seriously. I'm just letting you know, in case, you know, we get stranded or something. Without thinking about it, Malaise wraps up the 34 pounds of dragon jerky that remain in a piece of oilcloth and puts it in his bag of holding, along with five sticks of dynamite. Inesel brings some torches and oil. Case grabs a hammer, crowbar, and two coils of rope. Theophania grabs 20 pittons. Once everyone is comfortable with what they may need for going down a trap door, the captain steers the ship to a drop point that Inesil has designated, which is on the southwestern end of the ruins. To conserve fuel, Captain Fishtwain parks the lonely lady on top of one of the 300-foot arches, allowing the engines to rest and the dirigible to relax its weight. From that point, the crew can see the building within the trap door and keep a lookout for the party. On the ground, everyone moves quickly to the ornate building and once inside, takes a few minutes to study it in detail. The party makes investigation checks. Rolls 15, 11, 10, 11, 16, 5, and 6. Theophania and Peace seem distracted by the environment outside with memories of large water beasts chomping at them ferociously and cannot focus too much on what they are seeing. In a cell case and Malage get a good feel for the building and can tell that it was clearly of a very fine construction and has several smaller rooms with uniquely shaped windows, overhead holes in the stone for roof for possibly light or water, and a complex tile floor that is somewhat intact when the sand and dirt are cleared away. Fodinus recognizes the general layout of the building, which looks like, in the main room, could easily hold 40 to 50 people. Umgern quickly assesses the same layout as well as the symmetry of the room and a slightly raised dias on one wall. I am quite sure this is some sort of temple. Umgern runs his hand along the wall, appreciating how smooth the stone is despite centuries of pitting and damage. Fodinus nods and the others look around and seem to not offer any resistance to the explanation. Let's check out this trapped door. Case makes an athletics check, assisted by Peace. Advantage rolls 20. Case and Peace place the crowbar in the edge of the apparent trap door, tap a few times with the hammer, and then push on the bar with all of their strength, lifting the edge and sliding it over a few feet. A blast of slightly chilly air erupts from the hole, along with a bit of dust and debris, encircling Case and Peace and then dissipating quickly. Case and Peace make perception checks. Roll 13 and 17. Case sniffs the air and furrows his brow, smelling something odd. Peace looks at Case and the others and frowns deeply. We are certain that what lies below is mostly death and decay, friends. Umgern instinctively grabs his amulet and murmurs a brief prayer. Inesel and Theophania light torches from her bag. Malaysia's hair blazes with orange light and his hands illuminate with a small ball of flame. Case and Fodinus step down into the hole first. There is a spiral staircase leading down. Case continues down and out of sight, followed by Fodinus. The rest of the party follow one after the other. At the bottom of the stairs, Inesel and Theophania's torches illuminate a four-way corridor heading roughly north, south, east, and west. Immediately evident in the flickering twilight and beyond, with the benefit of dark vision, the walls contain three-foot by two-foot stone rectangles protruding into the passageways. The floor is littered with bones, many sunk deep into the dirt with only small protuberances visible. This is a crypt. Umgern moves closer to one of the rectangular boxes protruding from the wall. <laughs> there is writing here. The party each moves closer to one of the rectangles and studies the writing. The party makes history checks. Rolls 17, 14, 2, 21, 20, 18, and 19. I don't recognize this language at all, but I'm just a big dumb lion. Case laughs and studies the bones on the ground. It's Sylvan. Fodinus looks at the group. I don't speak it. Peace, Theophania, and Malage all pipe up in unison. I do. 
They all laugh and begin studying the nearest stone. The words are old and pitted and in places obscured by some sort of crypt moss growth. After a few minutes of looking at several stones, the three of them put their heads together for a moment and chat. Then Peace looks up. Well, this is quite amazing. Each of these rectangles appears to possibly be the end of a stone coffin. We can open one to be sure, but the writing at the end is sort of a life story. It has the person's name, their family connections, and mentions several things about them, like their occupation and any accomplishments. What is more fascinating is the dates and mention of events. If these several examples are the same throughout this script, there is literally an entire history of this culture waiting to be read. We do not know the date anchors or its relevance to current dates, but this area seems to be the original crypt. It was dug away from the stairwell. You can see that this tablet close to the stairwell has the dates AC001 to AC076, while this one two tablets down is newer, with the dates AC014 to AC081. What a find! One could transcribe each of these tablets and construct the history of these people. Peace is clearly excited and wrings their paws throughout their soliloquy. Malaysia and Theophania nod in agreement. AC is after Croesus. He was the first king of Ambath at the start of this age. Then the cataclysm of the north happened, which caused immense upheaval across all of Angantrian. That is why the current is Varana, or AHZ, after HZ. It is currently 502 AHZ, and the cataclysm occurred around AC 998, so the first people buried here are from the start of this age. Umgren looks at the writing again, his eyes filled with wonder. Wait, what is HZ? And how is time measured before AC? Malaysia begins reading another tablet while waiting for Umgren to respond. Before AC, there was a period of no time for the surface world, a dark period between the destruction of the last civilizations and the emergence of the new. For Drow, the current is Varana, is 57653, but we do not speak of that. That was the point at which the Drow began recording our history in the Underdark. The elves of the surface, of course, are similar. We even have historical text of those first elves. But the harsh history of this world has decimated the elves many times over. They have nearly gone extinct many times, along with most other races on the surface, in fact. But elves and Drow were the first rulers of this world. But there have been many others. At one point, the entirety of Engedrian was human, with all other races hiding from their tyranny and destruction. But the drow do not dwell in the past. Those long-dead civilizations are of no value to them. So, similar to the Mind Flayers, they concern themselves only with the here and the now. I have been told that the entire history of the surface world of Engedrian is recorded somewhere in some library in the Underdark, but we are forbidden to read about it because the ultimate result was the destruction and devastation of those civilizations. So my knowledge of this world in detail only extends to AC001. Before that, except for the general concepts and unarticulous accounts of the Isvara, I know nothing. Umgern stops and suddenly looks away. He walks many feet down the passage, and, from the darkness, the party can hear a gentle, slow sobbing. Malaysia turns to Peace and Theophania. I think it is our duty to gather this history and share it. If this is the civilization that was destroyed by Centrifugus, the Lowlemonstein Kingdom, there may be valuable information about what happened. He returns to the nearest tablet, reading furiously. But, little one... That could take many Quinn days, several moon turns even. We don't know how extensive this crypt is. Theophania pats the Genasi on the back. Peace frowns. You are right, of course, Theophania. We must spend many moon turns studying this crypt to write a proper history. Our suggestion is a cursory exploration of the crypt to map it properly, take a few rubbings for documentation, then return to the king to see if we can convince him to allow for a proper study of the site. Peace pulls a piece of parchment from their bag, snaps a bit of burnt wood from Theophania's torch, and makes a rubbing on one of the tablets. See, this is easily readable and will certainly prove our claim. Peace quickly makes five more rubbings and returns them to their bag. As they finish, Umgern returns to the group. This passage ends in a T-junction that goes pretty far north and makes a turn on going south. I think this is a very large crypt. 
Peace explains the rubbings and their idea to simply map it for now and return with the king's support. Umgern nods. Vizal appears on his shoulder and the rest of the party follows suit, calling forth their familiars. Better than going deaf and blind in the darkness, let's just stick to telepathic relays from the familiars every 100 feet. When we get to a junction, we will send them out in different directions. In a cell, can you and Case make maps? They both nod and begin making marks in the center of the parchment, looking up now and again to check their observation. Quickly, let's do this and get out of here. Although the crypt is very large, none of the passages are more than a hundred feet in length, so the familiars have no issue relaying the dimensions, distances, and number of sarcophagi they see. In addition to the constant sarcophagi protruding from the walls, they find the ends of large walls with ornately structured piles of bones made of multiple skulls and other bones designed to honor all of the dead, even those without a written history. Some of the tunnels end blind and have no sarcophagi, suggesting that these are the newest tunnels for the not yet dead, or they were. Occasionally, the crypt opens into large, round rooms, in the center of which is a column from the floor to the ceiling made of bones. The party makes medicine checks. Roll 18, 18, 18, 8, 14, 18, and 5. Throughout the crypt, Malaysia and Peace are a bit overwhelmed by all of the loose bones and try not to pay attention to them, focusing on reading as many of the tablets as they can. Umgern can see that some of the bones on the floor that are stomped down and half buried are orcs, ogres, kobolds, goblins, and minotaurs. The structures on the ends of the walls and in the centers of the rooms have some half-elves, halflings, half-orcs, and dwarves. Fodinus, Inesel, Case, and Theophania all pause at one of the central structures. There is a distinct difference between those bones on the ground and those bones in the columns. On the ground, you can see evidence of broken bones in life, poor dentition, and wear on the joints. These are the littered bones of slaves and are of orc, ogre, kobold, goblin, and minotaurs. The columns have half-elves, halflings, half-orcs, and dwarves, which have better dentition, no obvious trauma, and less wear on their joints. I think these were their servants. So who are in these crypts? Theophania stops and looks at the others who are all nodding in agreement. There is one way to find out. Case pulls the crowbar from his belt and walks over to one of the sarcophagi. In a cell, Umgern, may I? They both nod solemnly. As carefully as he can, Case taps the stone sarcophagus all around the end so that the tablet comes off in one piece which Fodinus catches and sets gently on the ground. Inside, amidst cobwebs and dust, Case can see the ends of some wrappings. He motions to Peace, who comes over. They both place their spears under the wrappings and slide them as far in as they can. Working together, they lift and carry the body out of the sarcophagus and lay it on the ground. Theophania unwraps the head. Human. Let's check a few more. Malage settles on the ground and begins his ritual casting of magic detection. The rest repeat the process, and after opening four more, they find the skulls of four more humans. No elves, no drow. Umgern sighs. But there are a lot of races missing. But do you think that this was a human society that kept other races as slaves and servants? Malage casts detect magic as a ritual. He completes his ritual and stands up, holding out his hands with his eyes closed. His eyes suddenly pop open and he turns to the party. There is a lot of magic here. It's coming from many of the sarcophagi, including these. He stoops down beside the first body that was opened and cuts through the wrappings down to the feet. Around the neck of the skeleton is a necklace made of gold with a large gemstone in a gold setting hanging from it. Malage makes an arcana check, rolls 25. This necklace is magical and holds some sort of binding spell. I can't be sure without investigating it further. He gently picks up the gemstone pendant and lifts it off the body. The chain easily releases from the bones. Malage stands up and walks it over to Inesel, who caresses the pendant as well. From behind him, the sudden creak and snap of bones merges with a sickening wailing sound. He turns and looks in horror with the rest of the party as the bones form into a standing skeleton which charges towards the pendant. Thank you for visiting Engedrian. Don't forget to find us on Facebook, X, formerly Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, and YouTube for additional content, battle maps, and background details. We hope you're enjoying our adventure. We can't wait to hear what happens next.